tremendous electric cab but we have to test this again? Um, test, yep. Go ahead. It's turning out all right? You can hear both of us speak? Fine. That's good. That's good. So we don't need to say one, two, three, four or anything then? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So General Vanier decided that he wanted you anyway, regardless of your... Uh, uh, well then, as you know, a lot of very unfortunate things happened. Um, before the Institute was really off the ground, General Vanier died. Um, Ernest Reed, who was the Anglican Bishop of Ottawa, who was one of the great moving spirits in the thing, died. Um, Arnold Heaney, who was another great moving spirit in the Institute, died. Jack Armstrong, President of Imperial Oil, who was a tremendous influence in the Institute because he was a great uh, opponent of concentrating on the family. Uh, he himself was a You do fix these things up, do you? Uh, he's a Mormon mm -hmm. and uh, has been very much concerned with uh, strengthening family life and sort of thing. And uh, so the Institute really, in my view, never really got off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember. Uh, the, the first president was Dr. Wilder Penfield, a great surgeon, neurosurgeon. And I remember at the first meeting of the board of directors, my saying that uh, the Institute has these aims of preserving, of strengthening family life. But I think one of the first things this board has to do is to try and really give serious thought what it means and what it's going to do. And Dr. Penfield, who's a very forthright man, uh, said, well, Sutton, if you don't know what we're going to do, I will tell you. And uh, before I could uh, do anything, I don't know what I would have done, he said, well, for one thing, we will uh, send out with every family allowance check in Canada a list of the books that parents are to see if their children don't read, I list the books there to see that they do read, and uh, this and that, what have you, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I nearly died to think that this is what we were going to do, but we didn't do that. I remember soon after that meeting calling Joe Willard, who was the deputy minister. He was a great social worker. Well, he wasn't a social worker technically, but mm. he made a great contribution to social work, and telling him that uh, this is the sort of thing that was going to he was on our board, but he wasn't at this meeting. He said, don't worry, we won't be doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it, it was an extremely difficult thing, because the people who conceived the idea, like uh, Gary and others, probably had a fairly clear idea in their mind what they were wanting to achieve, but just how it was to be done. I don't think it was ever clear in anybody's mind, except Dr. Penfield's, mm -hmm. and uh, none of the rest of us wanted to do it that way. So I never really got off to a very good start with the Institute for a number of reasons. Uh, in the early days, of course, one of the things we were concerned with was raising enough money to make ourselves viable. Before I went to the Institute, before I even was asked, I was asked by uh, Dr. Penfield to suggest some way of the thing being financed, and I said, then I remember sitting in our farm and writing a memo to him to the effect that we should not have annual campaigns for funds, but we should have one big campaign for a capital sum, and that we should make that big enough so that the Institute could, and this capital sum, sum should be unencroachable, in other words, could never be touched. Mm -hmm. And the income from that should be enough to support us. And what we finally hit on was six million dollars, and in those days the interest rate I think was about uh, 
five percent or something, and so that was going to give us three hundred thousand a year, which would have carried us. But of course, it went way higher than that. But nobody can touch the fund; it's there. And the way the money was raised was interesting. Dr. Penfield was a great money raiser, and of course, General Vanier's name was a tremendous asset. And people like Heaney and Jack Armstrong and Max McKenzie, who lives next door to me here, became chairman of the Finance Committee. Um, we got big contributions from a lot of people, including banks, and big corporations, and so on. And then the federal government, uh, they financed us our first year with grants from Health and Welfare. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, made a grant, and then they said that they would, uh, if I remember rightly, they made a grant of a million, two million dollars, for the plus. And then they said they would match dollar for dollar all other contributions. Well, I remember the Catholic Women's League, for example, raised a hundred thousand dollars. I'm sure that they were very idealistic about the whole thing and probably very upset the way things went. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to them. But we got their 100000 And the federal government had said that they would match every contribution dollar for dollar, so that meant we got 200000 mm -hmm. But we ended up with approximately five or six million dollars, uh, which in those days gave us an income of 5%. And of course, tax-free and all the rest of it. And that was a very adequate income to finance the modest institute that I saw. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the income would increase with inflation more or less. Mm -hmm. We set out doing certain uh, things that were basically important, I think, uh, by way of research into uh, Divorce, for example, research into uh, uh, marriage trends, research into all kinds of things relating to family, uh, and got certain publications put out that were valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, then, with the death of these key people, I was left kind of vulnerable and. Uh, as happens in these places, the, there are certain people on the board who have quite different ideas from the founders and the professional staff, and uh, that's when you split your ways. Mm -hmm. A question that, that I've wondered about, um, the, the period of time during which the Vanier developed um, was the period of time where the women's movement came to the fore, where uh, a new permissiveness in society uh, blossomed um, overnight. Uh, I can't think of a stronger word than blossomed, really, but uh, the, the flower children, the, the hippies, the, the new revolution and all that. It seems to me to be that those trends that were happening in society were uh, the opposite of the direction in which the Vanier, this, it sounds like, it was going. Did that kind of thing contribute to the difficulties that you had there? In a way, probably. Uh, some of us who, with our background I had, for example, were a little bit torn about what was happening and about what some people's concept of what the Institute was. And yet, even so, uh, while you could feel that you could support uh, some of the aspirations of the so-called hippie culture, uh, you could also support some of the um, ambitions that people had for a stable society. I mean, you didn't have to uh, feel that you were a party to contributing to a breakdown in society just because you contributed to people who contributed to uh, the, the 
freedom of expression of people who wanted to take issue with the uh, uh, sort of static society. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was a dilemma. I remember talking to a lot of young people about this. And I was very interested in finding that some of the so-called hippies used to say to me, well, you know, that's our problem, we feel we're ambivalent too. Mm -hmm. And uh, my reaction used to be, well, God bless your goal and where you're going, you'll find, you'll find where you're going. Um, I, think, I think that uh, the things that were happening then, with the exception possibly, and I don't know much about this, of uh, the virulent use of drugs that went on for a while, with the exception of other influences, there's a tendency for things to taper off a bit mm -hmm. without necessarily going all stodgy. Or am I wrong? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether you're wrong or not. The, the thing that I wonder about that, that I guess has not changed, um, that probably, at least in my view, has had more impact on family life than anything that's happened in the past 30 years is the pill. Well, this is something, yeah. And uh, I often wondered about that. I think poor little girls I used to know when I was in the Toronto Children's Aid, uh, who I was going to say consistently get pregnant. Well, they didn't happen more than about once a year, but they, uh, I think that when people say, well, now the pill is giving people freedom to uh, ignore all that we think is holy and so on, I, I don't accept that. Uh, these kids were doing what they do now, except they didn't have any protection. They did it anyway. They had babies. Do you think that uh, there was less uh, freedom between the sexes when people became pregnant, if, if there was intercourse, than uh, was otherwise the case? I don't know, Mr. Sutton. Um, I'm I often ask myself. Yeah, I I'm trying to see how the difficulties that you and the Vanya Institute had, had be were affected by what was happening in the larger society at the time. Well, I think they would have had, we, we would have had difficulties based on those considerations that you mm -hmm. have in mind. But some other difficulties arose that overshadowed everything else. These were personality conflicts. Mm -hmm. And that's what really did the thing in. Well, I shouldn't say it did the thing in because the institute's still going. And they have a man now as president who's a superb person. And I, I don't know. I haven't talked with him, but I know him very well and I have a tremendous respect for him. Uh, but I don't know what the institute's doing now. But mm -hmm. They've had their troubles. Mm -hmm. Even after I left, they had troubles, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a sense in which there was a lot of dynamite there because I remember writing a memo, I don't know what happened to it, saying that I thought that because the Institute was in danger of becoming so prestigious and had become so prestigious, I'll give you an example of it in a moment, that uh, I felt that it was absolutely essential that whoever was the executive director of the institute must retire at age 65, no matter what, because somebody could get in here and stay till they were 90. I don't know what's happened about that, but just to give you an idea of this prestigiousness, uh, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon of the institute, altogether too many people, because it was prestigious. And then there were other people like some of the ones I've named, Garig, Ernest Breen, Heaney, Jack Armstrong, uh, McKenzie next door, Max McKenzie, uh, Pat Fulton, a lot of other people, 
out of conviction. Um, all of them maybe having a slightly different idea than somebody else and exactly what was going to happen. But there was still this the thing that really bothered me from the very beginning of prestige and the thing. For example, we used to have our board meetings in a special room at Peter Hall down the road here. Uh, the Governor General would always come in and either sit through a meeting or grace us with his presence for a little while. And this sort of thing. And we'd have lunch at Government House. And uh, we were always thought of as something at Government House. We were a little holier than the House of Commons, I guess, in that respect. And some people on our board, I think, played that up to themselves. I don't think they could play it up to anybody else. I'll give you an example, though, of how this thing <coughs> nearly worked and also didn't work. The Queen and Prince Philip were here some time when the Institute was still quite new. I forgot that year. And uh, Dr. Penfield at a board meeting said that he thought we should arrange that while they were there, while they were here, that we would have a board meeting in Government House in this big room which was set aside for receiving ambassadors and so on. And that just by coincidence, while we were having a board meeting, the Queen would happen to walk in and uh, the Queen would have a little message for us and the Queen would walk out. And uh, this would go over the evening news all over Canada, this sort of thing. It would be great for the Institute. And General Vanier just sort of shook his head like that. No, didn't say any more. Well, anyway, things were going on and I found that arrangements were being made for the Queen to do this. Uh, I wasn't being asked to be involved in them because I don't know that I was supposed to know about it. But I did know about it. And one night, General Vanier called me at the office and asked if I'd drop in and see him on my way home. And I did. And he was not well. And as you know, he had one leg and he had it off and he was resting and he was sitting in a chair up in his quarters upstairs. And uh, he wanted to discuss something with me. And I don't remember what it was. And the question of the Queen's visit came up. And I said something about, well, during the board meeting here, and he said, but I said no to that. And, and I said, well, I'm afraid it's been arranged anyway. And General so-and-so was trying to figure it out how to give her 30 seconds or 45 seconds with us. And he said, I will not stand for having the Queen exploited in the interest of anything that bears my name, whether it's the Institute or anything else. I will not stand for it. And if she's coming in, I won't be there. I have too much respect for her. Well, then he blew his top and told me to get his secretary from downstairs, which I did. And uh, the two of us talked with him. And finally, he got very excited, very, very worried about this. So I said to him, well, we can easily call it off. I'm sure it would be the easiest thing world. If I call General Sonso, he call him right away. So I called General Sonso right away. And he said, oh, my God, I'm thrilled to have that called off because now the whole visit is going to be easier. So that was called off. And then he said, now call Penfield and tell him. That was very funny because they're both dead now, so I can say this, I guess. Uh, one time... I was talking to Dr. Penfield about something and uh, of his opinion and General Vanier's opinions and so on. And he said to me, well, you have to remember something that uh, uh, General Vanier is getting on in years, you know, and not got very good health. And, and uh, these things can affect a person's judgment, so you can make allowance for that. In other words, he wasn't agreeing with them. Penfield. So, not many days later, I was talking to General Vanier about something, and uh, this same subject came up. 
I said something other about it. He said, well, Stuart, he used to call me Stuart, Dr. Penfield called me something. Stuart, you just have to remember that we're both getting older now, and Dr. Penfield's getting on in years, and the judgment isn't the same as you do. <laughs> so just decide for yourself. But it was so interesting. Yeah. I really can't say much about the Institute. I think yeah. that, uh, uh, in my case, uh, uh, the point I want to make really is that uh, while some people may have been clear on what they thought they wanted from it, nobody was clear on how they proposed to get it. I mean, nobody had a clear practical idea. And uh, it took a lot of guts to stand up to all these people particularly when my main supporters were gone and I had to put up with other people. Mm -hmm. It must have been a difficult time for you. It was all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Um, Stuart, after you left the Vanier, uh, continued on, did some consulting work and were involved with a number of other organizations. I'm conscious that we've spent a lot of time together today, as well as in our previous interview. And I just want to move to a couple of general questions rather than spend some time on your uh, career uh, after yeah. the band. Yeah. Unless there's things that you'd like to add about uh, your time since then. I seem to like to talk, as my grandmother used to say, Stuart likes to talk, so I'm sorry, but <laughs> go ahead. No, no. Um, over the years, you've done so many things, worked many, played many parts of the world, many different agencies. What are the things of which you're most pleased, about which you're most pleased over the years? You mean jobs? Your accomplishments. Well, persuading Alice to marry me, I guess, is my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> having the children. Um, you mean in relation to work? Mm -hmm. Good question. In a way, in the very early days, uh, like with Russell Children's Homes and New York Country Children's Day, uh, when things were rough and tumble and uh, everybody was poverty stricken and uh, nobody expected much from anybody and everybody was grateful for any little thing, um, I think that. the regrets over the mistake ones made in those days and the sense of gratitude for the experience that one had in those days are the greatest things because uh, everything was right down to earth and uh, uh, people had awful problems and if you could do any little thing to help them or see them through or I think maybe uh, in terms of the things that are easier to measure, the amalgamation of the Children's Aid and the Homes of Toronto was, I think, possibly uh, one of my greatest peacetime uh, achievements. It wasn't my achievement, but I mean that I was associated with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Getting the social service program launched and going, no matter how modestly and how late in the Canadian Army during the war, to see how it's developed since and how it's been adopted by other armies and countries around the world is another one that gives me a great deal of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I'll always be grateful to UNICEF for the Africans and Arabs that I've met and known intimately, you know, on their own turf, so to speak. But uh, there's no other way you could meet. You know, I've often thought that if you were John D. Rockefeller himself with all his financial resources, you couldn't get into the places that I've been in, that I had to go to my job. In the, Africa and at least in other places, and uh, you couldn't buy your way into the sort of situations that you get into when you're working in those fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's not a very good answer to your question, mm -hmm. but... Uh, How about regrets? Well, I suppose I could list some regrets, except that the minute I think to myself that I regret this or that, I begin to think of all the things that go with it that I would never have done without, so to speak. So, uh, I think you learn so much from your mistakes and, and so you do from the things you regret that uh, and also you know you feel that if you hadn't done this or that you wouldn't have met so and so or somebody else or had this or that or the other experience it's hard to have regrets you know mm -hmm. you put that way mm -hmm. yeah it is because there's always some some new experience that comes out of what you've done whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing when I was a young social worker at uh, Rose and Children's Homes, I remember being offered a, what was a very tempting job by the uh, Deputy Minister of Child Welfare, Deputy Minister of Public Welfare for Ontario, who said, well, you know, you can't spend your life doing this kind of thing, running around after kids. Um, you should become a big executive sort of thing, this is your chance. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew even then uh, that wasn't what I wanted. So that's one thing I could have regretted if I'd done what he tried to make me do. <laughs> Don't have an opportunity to regret that. No. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for your uh, for, for the information and the and the experiences that you shared with us. Um, I want to thank you too for your patience in having gone through the interview again after our first difficulty. And uh, again, I want to tell you how much I've enjoyed it. It's uh, been really worthwhile for me. I appreciate the time and energy you've taken to to do this afternoon. Well, Karen, I've enjoyed it too, frankly. I I just wish that I could recall things more clearly and express them so express myself more uh, succinctly, maybe. But um, I'll think about it all after you've gone. <laughs> Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Welcome.